More with Mexico. Like Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant thought that the Mexican War was a bad war. He thought it was pure imperialism, and they did not particularly support it politically, but of course he served and served with distinction in the Mexican War. He was hoping to get a cavalry appointment, but he was appointed into the 4th Infantry um, Regiment and uh, as a quartermaster. Again, he wasn't happy with the quartermaster. He was hoping to be in combat, but that's where he got appointed. And the quartermaster procured supplies, distributed them to the, his troops, and kept them uh, at the tip of the spear, being with a full hank of the spear. And that was very important because uh, he learned how to do it uh, that would be very uh, useful to him as a general in the Civil War, which would be coming up in 20 years, because logistics became more and more important. He had that understanding. One of the other things that he learned to do was bake bread. Now, there are two types of bread in the Army at those days, the hard tack, which is a hard a biscuit type, and soft bread, and he learned how to make soft bread. And one of the things that he did was that he sold that bread to other members of the regiment to have money into the kitty for his regiment to help out with perhaps some family members at home that were on hard times or something like that. So he made money to support his regiment, which was quite important. Um, Grant served very credibly during the Mexican War. He served under um, Zachary Taylor. There were two generals in the Mexican War in the United States, Zachary Taylor and Winfield Scott. And there were very strong contrasts between the two men's styles. Zachary Taylor, who would later become President of the United States, was very informal. Instead of a uh, the kind of uniform that Winfield Scott would wear with all the braids and the medals and things of that sort, he would wear a duster's plantation coat. So, because he owned a plantation in Louisiana, and that's the way he would dress in a straw hat. So he was very informal. That's one thing that Grant emulated. As we all know, his uniforms was, were pretty informal, sometimes rumpled looking, not in any way similar to the way Winsfield Scott would look in his uniform. So that was one, one important thing we see that he learned. Another the aspect of the, the uh, style of management that uh, Zachary Taylor, or leadership that he had, was he wrote very clear uh, orders. Some officers would write orders with parenthetical clauses and things that would go along, and you try to read it and under, trying to understand what are they trying to say. Those kinds of orders led to confusion on the battlefield because it wasn't quite sure what he wanted to do. Now, sometimes I think these, uh, these officers wanted to do that so in case things went wrong, they could blame the other, the, his subordinate, for not following through properly. But Grant, on the other, Zachary Taylor, on the other hand, was very clear, terse, with action verbs, and that's the way uh, Grant uh, wrote uh, his orders. He learned that from Zachary Taylor. There was one incident that happened during the war that I think characterized Grant's approach to leadership, and that's really what we're talking about in these segments, leader, military leadership. Um, they were trying to bring supplies in from a large ship in the Gulf Coast to the shoreline there in Texas. And the whale boat, that they called, was the boat, rowboat that was bringing in the supplies. It ran aground several, uh, 10 feet or so out into the, uh, the ocean. And there were several of the young Confederate Southern officers who were the aristocrats and they were making fun of Grant and his leadership because what Grant had done was he took his jacket off, took his boots off, waded out into the water, and began to help the guys, the enlisted man, to unload the boat. And he was criticized by these young Southern uh, uh, officers who thought that there was this division between the officers and the enlisted men that should not be breached. Just at that point in time, Zachary Taylor rides by on his horse, and Taylor commends Grant for what he was doing and castigated these Southern uh, officers because they were perpetuating this unhealthy relationship. So that was a real good indicator of what Grant was going to do. Um, in the pre-World uh, War II era, there were very few medals that anybody could win. There were no silver stars, distinguished service crosses. So how did the Army recognize and promote, support the kind of valorous actions that it wanted its officers to undertake? This was something known as a brevet promotion. A brevet meaning a temporary promotion. So if you were a lieutenant and you did something that wanted to be recognized as a valorous action, you might receive a promotion, temporary promotion to, to captain, the next rank, and then the next time would be a major. 
most of the time those recognitions were done away with in peacetime or after the war was over and they would go back to being a lieutenant. But that was one way of doing it. Grant received two battlefield brevet promotions for two incidents that he was involved in and I think they're important to understand Grant. The first was that he was assigned to be a courier. Obviously, you know, in those days there wasn't telegraph, there wasn't uh, telephone or satellite communication. And generally speaking, they had to send a runner back and forth to carry out the, new, the, uh, the orders. Grant volunteered to run the orders that, that was given to him, and they was, had to go through one of the major areas where the battle was the heaviest, and bullets were flying, shrapnel bursting, and things of this sort. So Grant used his trick writing skills and dashed through, and one of the things that he did was if the enemy was over on the left side, he would ride on the side of the horse on the right side so they wouldn't see this horse running through. And as a result, he got the orders through and the action was was completed the way that they wanted it to do, so he received a brevet promotion for that. The second one was a situation where uh, the Confederate, the, uh, sol the American soldiers were in a bad situation where the Mexicans were on a hillside. They were shooting down to the American soldiers. They didn't have much uh, coverage. So Grant saw a tall uh, church steeple and a small cannon. So he persuaded his men, ordered them, to take apart the wheels of the cannon and lug it up to the top of the steeple, reassembled it, pointing the gun down on a plunging fire to where the Mexicans were and totally took care of the situation, saving those American soldiers. So for that, he also won a brevet promotion. Um, when he came back, one of the first things he did was to marry Julia Dent. Julia Dent was the sister of his uh, Rust Point roommate, Frederick Dent. And it was, by all accounts, a very successful, close relationship between the two of them, and Julia uh, was very supportive of her husband, and it was a good relationship. And I think that um, it was, she should, deserves a lot of credit for keeping him stable during his uh, career. After the war was over, he went out first to Michigan and then out west, and in, out west in California, Julia was not there. And she had just had a baby and they didn't want to go out to the frontier as a result of that. It was a depressing area, lots of clouds, rain. He was away from Julia. And this is where uh, historians believe that Grant began to drink. And it was reported that Grant was not a constant drunk, but that alcohol was like a disease to him. It was a poison that caused him to go totally out of control. He was a binge drinker, in other words. He came to the position where uh, it got to the point where his commanding officer, a captain by the name of Robert Buchanan, gave him the option of either resigning or receiving court-martial. He took a re the resignation, left the Army. And interestingly enough, uh, years later in 1864, about eight or nine years later, when Grant was chief of the uh, U.S. Army, he promoted Buchanan to major general. So he held no, uh, no hard feelings about that. Um, this was a period of time when Grant had a very hard time. He couldn't keep a job. The farming didn't work out. He tried selling cordwood. He was collecting um, rents for people. Eventually his father gave him a job in a store up in Galena, Illinois, and that was the time that the war broke out. So here was Grant, a West Point graduate, who had a very credible service, was brevet, two brevet promotions, but he could not find a job when the Civil War broke out. He looked everywhere. He went to Washington, the regular army, there wasn't anything to do with him. He went to Cincinnati to meet up with uh, George McClellan, who at that time was the commander of the Ohio militia. McClellan wouldn't even visit with him. Uh, he tried other places. He tried to, believe it or not, to get the bread banking contract for Camp Denison, which was a Civil War camp in Cincinnati. His friend Chilton White was the congressman, and he thought he had a chance there. He applied to um, Governor Dennison, who was his boy, one of his boyhood friends. And Dennison was about ready to give him a command of the 12th Ohio, which was interesting for a number of reasons and very important in the, the evolution of Grant as a, as a military commander. The 12th was at that time commanded by James Lowe, who was the gentleman who helped him get into West Point. So he was there at the point of perhaps removing his friend who got him into West Point, and the bad, the, Good thing is that that didn't happen for a couple of reasons. One of the main, that was John Lowe, I think I said James, I meant to say John, um, was because 
the 12th Ohio went into the eastern part of the Eastern Theater. It was under the command of McClellan. And they were very hidebound, and they didn't really know what they were doing in, in many ways. And they certainly, Grant certainly would not have had the opportunity to bloom as his commanding officer if he was in the, in the east rather than the west. So what do we know about Grant as a, uh, as a commanding officer? What distinguished him? A number of things that I thought was interesting. At the Battle of uh, Fort, Don Fort Donelson, Grant, for the very first time in military history, had his officers synchronize their watches. So in other words, he told everybody to, to go off, say, at 6.30 in the morning. He made sure that everybody was on the same page as far as their clocks were concerned. That was something new and different. He also perfected the um, art of two-dimensional warfare. What we mean by this is two-dimensional warfare was that it had water, which was the, represented by the Brown Navy, the gunboats, interacting with the military, amphibious assaults and things of this sort. Again, he was one of the first to develop that, and it was particularly in the campaign at Vicksburg in 1863 where he perfected that particular art. Um, he characterized war by saying, the art of war is simple enough. Find out where the enemy is, get him as soon as you can, strike him as hard as you can, as often as you can, and keep moving on. That pretty well symbolized his theory of art, of war. Um, another thing, uh, aspect of his personality that he had that was very uh, useful and unique is he seemed to have a photographic memory for land features. If he walked a piece of ground for a little, maybe even 10 years before, he knew where the rises were, where the ravines, ravines, the water features, and this helped him picture the battle in his mind, and he was able to somehow with his picture in his mind, be able to see the battle in motion and be able to direct his forces to where they needed to go. And that was a, that was a very useful talent. Um, he also was very interested in intelligence. Uh, he wanted to know where the enemy was, what his strength was. He set up an intelligence network using spies, and many of the spies were, success, were uh, black or African American, some of whom were slaves. And oftentimes the Confederates didn't consider the slaves worthy or human, uh, they couldn't write, but they sure could listen and talk, and they, they gave up all their secrets to the slaves who were, who were giving them food, and Grant made great use of that. So what the, what's the question you know, that we always hear, who is the better general, Grant or Lee? Um, I will go say that Grant was. Grant was Lee, and here is, and I think he agrees with me, this is my little bobblehead, you agree with me you're the better general? Yes, I am. So there, that's the end of that part. Uh, he agrees with me. Uh, I think most, most, general, most historians say that Grant was the better general. He was able to incorporate the three levels of military operations, the tactics, which is at the, the lower level, the operations, the middle level, and the campaign. And he recognized that uh, the strategic level, that the war wasn't about one big battle like Grant did, uh, like Lee did. Uh, the Battle of Austerlitz it was one that he'd always studied. That was Napoleon's greatest victory, and he thought if he had one great victory at Chancellorsville, one great victory at Gettysburg, the war would be over. Grant saw it differently and understood that that's not the way the war w works anymore, that it was longer and that you had to destroy the enemy's ability to fight, and that was, that was one of the other the greatest things. Um, but I think that the uh, one aspect that also needs to be considered is that Grant, and we'll talk about this later, was considered to be a butcher, that he was, didn't care about his men, and he just inflicted more casualties. Modern historians have determined that Grant's casualty rate inflicted upon the enemy was greater than the one that he suffered. So in other words, he killed more enemy, destroyed more enemy than what troops he suffered. Um, no doubt that in, in looking at the, uh, the war that Lee's greatest, greatest battle was at Chancellorsville, where he completely defeated the Army of the Potomac. Uh, his greatest defeat was, was Gettysburg, which uh, they said that the Pickett's charge was the price the Confederacy paid to have General Lee as his general. And with Grant, his greatest victory was at, at Vicksburg, and his greatest defeat was at Cold Harbor, which uh, 6,000 casualties were suffered in about 15 minutes. Grant should never have charged, and he agrees that that was the biggest mistake he made. And one of the other things that he did which he very much regrets, is he did not want to make it look as if Lee had a victory. So when the time came to ask for a truce in order to remove 
the wounded from the field, Grant refused to ask for that because he didn't want to give that indication that he lost. And dozens of men died as a result of not getting there in, this, in the hot sun. That was said to be the, the price the Union had to pay for Grant. 